Good evening. I know you all came here to see Bill Bless. And I just wanted to point out a few things to you about Bill Press. He's the host of the Bill Press Show, which you'll see in here, uh, a national syndicated uh, radio talk show airing weekdays on Sirius XM satellite radio and on many local stations across the country. Mr. Press likes to talk a lot about complex political issues, drawing on his extensive experience. Taking Ryan is on a ride on the political roller coaster as he turns an engaged eye towards Congress. He'll talk about the president, presidential candidates, and other Washingtonians. He brings a wealth of experience to the radio and his politics and media. For 25 years, he's been a major player in the state national politics in addition to hosting top-rated radio and TV shows in California and national cable. You will also notice that he's a former co-host of the MSNBC's Buchanan and Press, a fiery debate program focusing on the most complex of contemporary issues along with Pat Buchanan. I saw that show and they really had a good time. You may not have, but they did. Okay. Prior to his role at MSNBC, he was co-host of uh, Crossfire. When I was coming in this evening, a friend of mine was sitting in her car waiting for the program to start. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to go in and finish dinner with Bill Press and all our guests this evening. And um, I think it's going to be an exciting program. She looks at me, she says, I always watched him. So I think there's a lot of people that look at it and say, Crossfire, yes, we know exactly who that person was. In addition, he's an award-winning radio talk show host and television commentator. And this evening at dinner, he said he has always been a commentator. He began his career as a political commentator at KABC TV. And if you notice, he hosted uh, True American, Southern California's number one AM radio station, and was a regular weekend talk show host on KFI AM from 91 to 96. He's received numerous awards. Now, I don't know if that means that you can judge by awards or get exactly how good somebody is, but I think when you get some of these awards I'm about to mention, you are good. Or at least those people giving you the award thought you were good. So Bill Press has received numerous awards for his work, including four Emmys and a Golden Mike Award. He was named Best Commentator of the Year by the Associated Press in 1992. He's enjoyed a high-profile career in government, and he even mentioned that he's run for office um, before. He also said he lost. And he was chairman of the California Democratic Party from 1993 to 96. In June 1990, he was a candidate in the Democratic primary for California State Insurance Commissioner. He is also a national syndicated newspaper columnist. His weekly column is distributed by Tribune Media Services to newspapers across the world. Something I just want to end with. We had a discussion tonight, and the question was, what role has cable news played in elections and in the lives of of Americans or people in general, and that's versus newsprint. Well, when we asked him about it, he made the comment that he receives three newspapers and he feels like a dinosaur. And he talked about a variety of things. My comment to that, if he feels like a dinosaur, what must those people do that don't read but rely on just hearing the news from other people as well? I will now turn the program over to uh, the director of the Dole Institute of Politics, Bill Lacey for what I think will be an exciting interview. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? You can, can't you? Okay. Try it out, Bill. Uh, and five, four, three, two, one. We okay Good. coming through? Very Good. Good. Okay. Uh, thank Good you evening. so much for joining us tonight. We're just ecstatic that you could be with us and. Uh, no, you've got a very early morning show to put on your shows at 6 o'clock Eastern Time, right? 5 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning I'll be at the studios of K LWN. KW KLWN 3125 6th Street, <laughs> West 6th Street. That's, uh, that's all I know. So I figure since I have to be there at 4 o'clock in the morning, I might as well not go to bed. We'll just stay up all night and talk politics. <laughs> better, than, better than that, Bill. We'll just all go and down to the radio station. We'll be your live audience. All right. That'll be fun. <laughs> That'll be fun. How did you get started in politics and in being a commentator? Uh, first, let, let me just say how excited I am to be here, Bill. And thank you for making it possible. And thanks to my friend Ray Strother uh, in the back for inviting me to be 
uh, part of his uh, seminar this afternoon. It was a great fun meeting with the students. And I, I'm particularly honored to be here, uh, and I thank you all for coming out tonight, because uh, Bob Dole, when I went back to Washington and uh, became co-host of Crossfire, uh, he was one of our frequent guests, one of our favorite guests, and became um, a very close, and still is, a close friend of mine, uh, a man that I think represents the best uh, in American life, not just in American politics. Uh, and um, uh, if I may repeat a story I told the students this morning, just to, to me it shows, or this afternoon, uh, how, how for Bob Dole, public service is what he was all about. And of course, he, his life was a life of public service, both in the military and in the political arena. Uh, and um, I was, when I got back to Washington, I admired our new mayor, Tony Williams. And I wanted to be part of what he was doing, so we put together a little kitchen cabinet that I was part of. And this was in the first year of, of Tony Williams, mayor of of Washington, D.C., which is after our nation's capital, important city. Tony Williams, a very impressive guy. And um, he was worried about just getting started, about having to run for re-election in three years. And so a few of us thought, you know, we want to help Tony out. And one of the ways to get rid of that worry is to raise so much money up front that nobody would dare run against him because they knew he was so strong. So um, I don't know which of us had this idea. I'd like to think it was my idea. But at any rate, I went to Bob Dole, and I said, would you consider, because mayor, mayor of any city is a nonpartisan post, and I went to Bob Dole, and I said, would you consider helping us raise some money for Tony Williams? And he said, absolutely. I want Tony Williams to succeed. We need this for Washington. And then I went to Bill Clinton and asked him, would you consider helping us raise some money for, Bob, for uh, Tony Williams? And he said, of course I would. Again, Washington's our, our home and, and uh, our nation's capital. And these are two guys who ran against each other, right, in 1996. And we put together a small group as a fundraiser in Washington, D.C. Um, for Tony Williams, Bob Dole and Bill Clinton, the co-host of it. Uh, they were both there. They both spoke. They were in great form that night, and we raised a million dollars that night for Tony Williams, thanks to Bob Dole and Bill Clinton, and nobody dared run against Tony Williams. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, was really, it was really a memorable uh, evening, and um, again, a great, great American. And this is a w such a wonderful, beautiful institute. Congratulations. Thank it's you. It's exciting to be here. I got started in politics, and I'll tell you uh, how, because my grandfather was mayor of the small, I grew up in a small town in Delaware, by the name of Delaware City. Uh, it's nowhere as big as it sounds. 1,200 people on the banks of the Delaware River, 15 miles south of Wilmington, and my grandfather was the mayor of that small town. And uh, I remember riding with him in his pickup truck, I did often, but particularly one day, and we're driving along, and somebody stopped him and had a, some problem, I don't know what it was, it might have been a pothole, it might have been a street light or something, and talked to the mayor about it, and I remember granddad said, you know what, I'll get on that, you know, we'll get that, we'll get that fixed, and that just sort of stuck with me, you know, the politics was, was something special about helping people. And then in high school, I was editor of our school newspaper and president of the student council, and John F. Kennedy, senator from Massachusetts, who had just been rejected as a Democratic Party's vice presidential nominee, so was still a senator from Massachusetts, came to Wilmington, Delaware, and I got to interview him for our school newspaper. So Great. I have that picture shaking hands with John F. Kennedy, like Bill Clinton, you know. And that kind of stuck with me. Well, then after, and so when I graduated from high school and I uh, decided that I wanted to become a priest, and I spent the next 10 years studying for the priesthood, was never ordained. And then so politics went bye-bye during that time because we were not allowed to get involved in politics. When I left the seminary, I went to San Francisco, and the first thing I did was I walked downtown and I volunteered for the McCarthy for President campaign. <laughs> And I've been hooked ever since. So, <laughs> and you'd be amazed at how many former priests, former seminarians, former nuns are involved in working for government or in public service in some way, because it's a different form of public service, really. Yeah. Now, the book is, is Trainwreck, the end of the conservative revolution. We're going to be 
uh, doing a book signing immediately after our program tonight back in uh, right at the, the door. And, and I would encourage everybody to take a look at this book. Now, most of you know I'm a conservative Republican and pretty proud of it. Um, and I can't say I agreed with everything that Bill said but uh, in the book, but uh, I was actually surprised by the, the amount of stuff I did uh, agree with him on. So I would encourage conservatives to pick it up as well tonight. But now, it, it's a fun book. It's not funny, but it's a fun <laughs> book because you get to cover a lot of ground. Now, early in Trainwreck, you write this, and th this is pretty good. If the Republicans were a restaurant, they would have been closed by the Board of Health. <laughs> if they were a Hollywood starlet, they'd be in rehab. <laughs> well, what's, the, what's the essential premise of the book? <laughs> Uh, the essential premise of the book is that conservatives came to power with a set of principles that they always told us that they believed in, and they delivered just the opposite of what they had always promised. So therefore, um, they failed. And, um, and, and I conclude, <laughs> using my um, author's imperative of exaggerating a point, to make a point perhaps, that therefore they should never be trusted with power again. Um, but, uh, and I, I point out a book, if you think about it, and, and it's interesting because I was on Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough right after, and I knew Joe when he was a, one of the managers of the Clinton impeachment process and was a frequent guest on Crossfire. I got to know him then. And I was on his show, and uh, I said, Joe, it seems to me here are the five things that conservatives always say they believe in. Um, here's what we're going to, here's what we're all about, here's what we deliver. Smaller government, listen carefully, smaller government, fiscal responsibility, a non-aggressive foreign policy, a constitutionally limited chief executive, and states' rights. Right. If you go back and you read Russell Kirk, who's sort of the founding father of the modern conservative movement, or William F. Buckley, Jr., or Robert Taft, I consider the sort of the icons of the conservative movement, they all say kind of that's what they believe in. And Joe Scarborough right away said, that's, you're right. He said, that's why I was elected to Congress, to fight for those things. Okay. So, what did, so for at least the first six years of the Bush presidency, they controlled the White House, the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, and I would add the media, uh, but certainly the first four. And what did we get? We have the largest federal government ever, largest federal workforce ever, largest federal budget ever. Fiscal responsibility, we have the biggest federal deficit ever, the biggest national debt ever, over $9 trillion. That's before the bailout bill. The biggest trade deficit ever. Uh, we have a, a foreign policy, now the Bush doctrine, officially, and I'm sure most of you know what about it, know what it is, <laughs> even if she doesn't. Um, Who are we talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> who sa which says, as articulated, that we have the right to go anywhere in the world and up to overturn any government that we think that someday might become a threat to the United States. Uh, we have a chief executive and a vice president who really believe in many ways that they're uh, above the Constitution or above the law. They've acted that way in terms of the, the NSA spying program, torture of prisoners in camps around the, around the world. And we have an administration that has run roughshod over states' rights, um, moving into states and trying to overturn state initiatives or state law whenever they disagreed with what the Bush administration doctrine was. So. Uh, that's my point, is that they, they came to power and they delivered just the opposite of what they promised, which I think has been the downfall of the conservative movement. Now, I, I'm curious what you think about th this statement. Um, if I may just add, absolutely. that doesn't mean, because politically there's, you know, things, it, we, we do live on a roller coaster. And, and I'd be the first to admit, it doesn't mean that the conservative movement will not rise again just like a one time after George McGovern, everybody said, well, liberals are done, you know, well, they finally got their stuff together, <laughs> sort of, maybe. Uh, and I, I, I'm not saying that, that it's impossible that the conservative movement will have a, see its day again, but for the time being, I think they're definitely uh, um, out of power and out of um, favor. Okay. 
I want to read a statement to you and get your reaction to it. The uh -oh. Bush administration has now provided three case studies in arrogance, isolation, and destructiveness. Michael Brown during Hurricane Katrina, Ambassador Jerry Bremer in Baghdad, and Secretary Paulson at Treasury. It's a tragic and very expensive legacy. You wouldn't disagree with any of that, would you? What's the third one? The Secretary Paulson at Treasury. Mm -hmm. I th isn't that, was that George? I just read that. Is that George Will? Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich, right. <laughs> Said that this week. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to admit to you, but for once I agree with Newt Gingrich. <laughs> 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 well, you see, that's, that, that, that's it. If you, you know, Pat Buchanan and Bob Novak became very good friends through the Crossfire days. Um, you know, there's nobody been more critical of the Bush administration in some ways, particularly on the spending issue, the spending side, and also on the growing government side, than Novak, Buchanan, Newt Gingrich, and lately George Will. Uh, no, I could, I could not disagree with that. And and they were there were three cases where um, they just failed to deliver. Now let me tell you where I'm going with this, Bill, because when, when I read and and and. I think everybody knows we do so many programs here. I can't honestly tell you I've read every word of your, your book tonight, but I, I went through it. I'm um, a talk show host, and I interview a lot of authors. Uh, and I'd be lying if I said yeah, I read every you, one of you, the books. You understand. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I paged through it, literally page by page. And there are 235 pages in it. And, you know, I came away thinking this. If I could edit out 10 pages of it, less than 5% of the book, I can make it a, conservative, a conservative's indictment of the Bush administration. Well, here's what's, and that's what surprises me, is I'm surprised, uh, it, it, let, me, let me just jump forward. One of the things that we hear today, and you will hear today, is don't blame conservatives for what happened. Don't blame conservatives for this big budget, for the budget deficit, for torture, for all that stuff. It was or the, the wiretap program. It was George Bush, and he's not a real conservative. You know? um, but the fact is, it wasn't just George Bush. Everything that George Bush did, has accomplished, he did with the support of the conservative majority, at least, again, for the first six years, and for even for the last two years with the conservative members of the House and the Senate. And what surprises me, Bill, is that during this time, uh, that there weren't more honest to God, blue blood, you know, true blue, if you will, conservatives who didn't stand up and say, wait a minute, you know, you know, we can't expand the Department of Education as big as we are. We can't expand government as much as we are. We can't, we can't have all these budget deficits. And I, I think uh, to their you know, to their detriment, they they went they went along because of party loyalty rather than loyalty to their principles. And I guess does that, that make sense? That I mean, makes I, perfectly good sense. And I don't disagree with anything you just there said. There were some voices, by the way. You know, Novak, as I say, Novak. One thing I like about love about Bob Novak and Pat Buchanan. I mean, right. they are they are steady. They are consistent, day in and day out. But I think too many others. Uh, and Pat's not even a Republican anymore, but too many others just think, well, I mean, I really don't like this, and this is not what we're all about, but, you know, for sake of my party, I've got to go along. I think you're absolutely right. I think you make a very good point, Bill. Uh, back during the Nixon administration, National Review, which was William F. Buckley's publication and was considered, still is considered by many to be the flagship of the conservative movement in terms of publications, actually printed an editorial withdrawing support from Richard Nixon. Now, you all say, so what? I mean, it didn't really have any effect, but at least was drawing a line in the sand. Why don't you think some conservatives drew the line in the sand sometime until basically John Boehner did the other day in terms of uh, the bailout bill. Oh, it is interesting. This bailout bill was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for everybody. And I think that is what contributed to its defeat uh, on Monday. Uh, they were able to probably round up enough Democrats to vote for it, although a lot of Democrats didn't. 
but there were too many House Republicans who finally said, we just, we just not, we're just not going to do it anymore. We're just not going to roll over one more time. That plus the fact that George Bush only has you know a few months to go, it made it made it easier for them. Um, again, I think it is. Um, and you've been part of the White House in Washington, worked there. I mean, you know, uh, the power that a uh, that a White House can in, can, can exert on members of their own party uh, in the Congress. And um, I think it was, I think it was political pressure and putting. Loyalty to party ahead of loyalty to country and loyalty to one's principles. I think that's a fair assessment. I think, uh, and this may be a naive point of view, and it may be totally wrong, but I think if uh, President Reagan had betrayed his principles, that people would have walked out of the White House because we were there because, not of Reagan, but because of the principles that he espoused. It, yeah, I, I, I guess, and I've never worked in a way, but it must be a tough point where you get to, it must be a very tough to, personal decision when you get to the point where the person you believe in and the person you're there to support because that's, that person has gotten elected and is articulating your principles does something that philosophically you can't support. What do you do in that case? I guess maybe once or twice you say, well, can't win every battle. But there has to come a point where you say, we're not winning any battles. This is going in a different direction, and i got to get off this boat. Yeah. Well, for everybody who expected to come and get fireworks tonight, it doesn't look like you're going to get them very much. <laughs> As I told you, after I read the book, I agreed with a lot more. Um, well, you tell me would. why you don't think conservatives. I mean, is it, is it because conservatives don't have any backbone I, I, or don't have any principles? <laughs> Fair question. Which is it? I, let's, I think, let's get down here. I, I, know, I, <laughs> my, to be very honest, that's a very fair question. I think after Gingrich and Dole left Congress, we lost our way. We lost our leadership. We lost our compass. Now, everybody knows Bob Dole was not a strong conservative, but he voted conservative most of the time, and he was a very strong leader. And it's very clear to me that the guys who replaced the two of, of them were just prepared to go along, and that's exactly what they did. I'm not trying to justify that, but I guess my question, all this leads but, me uh, to... I just wanted to... Yeah, just one, please. Um, there's one... Uh, what I... Uh, and I'm not, I'm not here to, to really make this all about the book or just to sell books, but I just wanted to... I think this is one illustration um, that... Um, what I tried to do is I took each issue that you might think of that, that we're dealing with and that they're dealing with in Washington, whether it's the environment or fiscal responsibility uh, and, um, and or foreign policy and try to look at, okay, here's where they started promising and here's where we ended up and how we got there. And the beginning of each chapter, to sort of illustrate that, I have quotes from early cons conservatives and modern day cons conservatives. Uh, to me, the most important discussion is about executive authority, because it's what the White House, it's what the presidency is all about, and that's what we're about right now, electing a new president, and uh, and 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 how much power the president should have, and you know, just a, a quick tangent there, background there is that we do have three equal branches of government, but inevitably, with three, one of them is going to become a little more powerful than the others. But our, our founding fathers, if you read them. They really felt that of the three, that the most powerful would should be the legislature. Uh, if you read the Constitution, it's pretty clear. I mean, only the Con only the Congress can impeach a president. The president can't impeach members of Congress, for example. Only the Congress t can declare war. The president can't declare war. So, yes, they're equal. But if one has, you know, the primacy, it would be Congress, not the executive. So that John Adams, for example, said that. The executive should never exercise the legislative and judicial powers to the end that it may that we may be a government of laws and not of men. Well, flash forward to Richard Nixon, who says, "When the president does it, that means it's not illegal." <laughs> you know, and. <laughs> And then, now remember, so Nixon goes, who takes his place? Jerry Ford. Who is Jerry Ford's chief of staff? Dick Cheney, right. 
So all of us might think, if we were asked what president has really usurped the powers of the presidency, uh, we would probably all say Richard Nixon. But Dick, we might believe that Dick Cheney didn't believe that. He believed from that point on that Richard Nixon gave away too much power uh, through the Watergate scandal. And, and it was Cheney's mission, and he admits that, by the way, uh, from that point on to try someday to, get, to restore those lost powers to the presidency. And he finally gets his chance when he's vice president. Uh, with George W. Bush. And so right after he's elected, George W. Bush says, if this were a dictatorship, it would be a heck of a lot easier, as long as I'm the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure that meant in jest, but mm, not entirely. <laughs> now you go through a whole series of areas. And um, you touched upon this, and I was actually going to ask you about it, but you beat me to the punch. You really kind of lay out the way conservatism was seen by Russell Kirk, Bill Buckley, Barry Goldwater even. And then you go and you basically right. say, you know, the guys who are there now have just chronically and continuously abused each of these major tenets of, of, of what they said their philosophy was. Yes, yes, and I, you mentioned Barry Goldwater. I, I wish I talked about him this afternoon. You know, the more I look back at Barry Goldwater, the more I admire Barry Goldwater. It's, I can't believe I hear myself saying that, but you know, I mean, Barry Goldwater did say about uh, gays in the military, it doesn't matter whether they're gay or straight. The only thing that matters is whether they can shoot straight. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, you know, and he was a, you can't say he wasn't a true conservative. And, uh, and I love the fact that when um, Sandra Day O'Connor was nominated to the Supreme Court uh, and Jerry Falwell uh, was leading the opposition to her because Jerry Falwell thought she was too soft on the issue of abortion, that um, Barry Goldwater said that every good thinking Every good believing Christian should line up and kick Jerry Falwell in the ass. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> so I, I found I must say, you know, um, that reading Russell Kirk and, and and the ones I mentioned and Barbara Taft and and Barry Goldwater and William F. Buckley Jr. There's there is a there there is a lot of wisdom there that I think if followed would we'd be in a better place today. Than, 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 than we are. Uh, and um, by, by the way, if I can, just to, 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 on, on Robert Taft. Uh, Taft is known, perhaps, as Mr. Republican, Ohio Republican, ran for, this, never, never made it to the White House, tried. But uh, he's probably best known for being like one of the last voices in opposition to United States entry into World War II. But it's where, when you read him, what, where Taft was coming from was not that he was a pacifist. It was that he was afraid of the extraordinary powers that any president would grasp and seize in wartime. And we'd seen it, you know, from even Abraham Lincoln, who suspended habeas corpus during the time of the Civil War. So his opposition to war was because at wartime, a president believes he can operate with extraordinary powers and operate above the law, which, was, I th which is, I think, a very legitimate concern and something you have to weigh before you move into war, something we don't really talk about today. Now, you've spent a lot of time on, on TV, and this, this actually came up a little bit earlier today. You spent a lot of time on TV, usually on shows where there was where you did, where the producer of the show or the designer of the show kind of did the way we do here. You kind of build a balance into the show. You kind of two contrasting points of view. Um, what's your take on the current state of uh, cable TV? <laughs> uh, is this on the record or off the record? <laughs> it's, it's on the record, so okay. adjust your uh, comments accordingly. No, I don't have to. I never adjust my uh, That's part of my problem. I've never in my life adjusted my comments accordingly. Um, for, first of all, I have to tell you, you know, I went back to do Crossfire. I think Crossfire was, Crossfire was the first of the political debate shows ever on CNN. started uh, with Tom Braden and Pat Buchanan actually as a radio show. And Ted Turner heard it 
and um, said, this would be good for CNN. He had starting a new network at all these hours he had to fill. Uh, and when I got there, it had been on the air for um, maybe 15 years. And I was there for another six, and then it lasted another year after I left, and then they canceled the show. But I, I think Crossfire was not only the first, but the best of the political debate shows, uh, because it was a half an hour, and it was one issue for half an hour, and you had a host on the left, a host on the right, and two experts. You know, and the experts, one, one on either side of an issue, they would know the issue, and we would just have to know enough about it to ask questions of the experts. And you had a half an hour, and it was unscripted, live, national TV, anything could happen. And sometimes, you know, things did happen. I, I'll tell you my favorite Crossfire story, and then I'll answer your question. But um, I, I love the story about, because people used to think that, I used to always get this question, how far ahead of time did you decide what issues you were going to debate? Like, people thought we did this like weeks ahead of time. I said, are you crazy? You know, we don't know from one day to the next what we're going to debate. Because we always want to have, we always want to be on the hottest issue and of the day. So we would have a news a conference call in the morning to decide what topic we were going to debate that night. And um, sometimes it was obvious. You know, the last few days you'd be debating the bailout, obviously. You know, that's the only thing people were talking about. And, uh, but some days... You'd be surprised, you know. Nothing's going on. There's nothing out there. So we had one of those days, and Pat Buchanan and I were on the uh, on the conference call, and so uh, we just decided, well, we don't know. We're just going. We'll just float and see what happens. So I went on online. I was looking through some news stories, and I saw a story out of Kansas City, actually, come to think of it, where uh, the Kansas City City Council had voted that uh, every night on the cable local cable channel. They were going to show the faces and the names of men who'd been arrested for soliciting prostitution the night before. Uh, they had not, they'd been arrested, but they had not been tried, they'd not been found guilty, but their careers were going to be destroyed. And I thought there were certain right of privacy, maybe, issues here involved. So I called the producer and suggested this is a topic. And she said, oh, that's a great topic, great topic. We'll go find some guests. So she called me back about an hour later and said, we have our first guest, Jerry Falwell. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, that's great. And she said, uh, so who do you think we should get as a, on the other side? And I, smart ass that I am, I immediately said, how about, why not a prostitute? And she says, where do I find a prostitute? <laughs> I said, don't ask me, right? You know. But then I thought, in San Francisco, there is a group called Coyote which is an acronym for Cast Off Your Old Tired Ethics, Coyote. Uh, it's a, it's a, a labor union for prostitutes. It's their, their union. So they call it Coyote. They get the head of Coyote. And so I'm telling you, just to see her alongside of Jerry Falwell was worth the price of admission. <laughs> All right. So I know. It was a long story, but I'll get to the. So uh, we had a rule, you know, that the, the host would ask one question and then two follow-ups. And then the other guy would take over. Okay. So, um, Pat goes first to her. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us now. Uh, so, is it true that you're a prostitute? And she said, well, um, I'm not going to uh, lie on, I, I don't want to lie, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to admit that I break the law, but I'm also not going to lie on national television. I thought that was a pretty good answer, you know, she, so she sort of, you sort of knew what the answer was. And then Pat says, this isn't for, uh, so have you always been a prostitute? No. His next follow-up is, and what was your job before you were a prostitute? And she says, I was a Los Angeles police officer. <laughs> now Pat's got his first question and his two follow-ups, right? So it's my turn, but I can see Pat's on a roll, man. He's gone for that next question. So I just lay back, I let him go, and he says, well, why did you change jobs? And she said, because I thought I needed a more noble profession. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to tell you, Jerry Falwell, he's probably his mic about he's trying to get off the set. It was a very funny moment. Uh, but the question is, <laughs> it's a serious question. I never let Pat forget that moment. Uh, a serious question about the role of the media. I, as a member of the media, with my own radio show, and I still do a lot of television, 
I, I have been uh, not more than disappointed. I've been appalled by the performance of the media overall in this uh, in this election campaign. Uh, I must say, I think that they have done a disservice to the American people by um, by taking sides, uh, by not telling the full story, by uh, exaggerating some stories, by blowing th some issues and comments way, way out of proportion. And, and the, I guess the, the biggest complaint I have is that I, I, I have always been, as Barbara mentioned, uh, a political commentator. So I've always been, by the way, it's the best job in the world. I get paid to give my opinions, right? You all have opinions, you give your opinions all the time, but I get paid <laughs> to give mine. And, as, and it's been that way from the beginning. So I'm expected to have a point of view, but pardon me, reporters and anchors and networks are not expected to have a point of view. They're just supposed to report the news as it is and let us decide what to think about it, whether it's good or bad. And all those, that, that line has been crossed and by everybody just about this, this year. So, um, and, I, and I think that that makes it, uh, I think that that's, that's not their role, it's not their job, and uh, overall when we look back at who won and lost this election, I think the big loser is going to be the American media in terms of reputation and credibility and trust. And once you lose that, uh, it's hard to get it back. What's your assessment of the current status of the presidential campaign? I think it's Obama's to lose. Um, Meaning, if you look at um, at the way things are going, uh, and I'm I'm a Democrat and I'm an Obama supporter. I don't want to you know pretend that I'm neutral in this race. But uh, with the war and now in our in its, in our sixth year, uh, and Americans, I think whether the issue is no longer whether we should have gone there or not. The issue really is how can we get out honorably, and and who's going to most likely do that with is, with, with with the war with the budget deficit and particularly with the economy and just you know bill how it works after eight years we all have i think we have collective add you know after eight years we sort of want to move on and do something different go in a different direction i mean that feeling of change i think is very real uh, with all of that um i think the advantage is clearly toward obama particularly now that the economy has taken over as the as the primary issue um we have two, I think, two outstanding candidates. I think we have two candidates who, like Bob Dole, are more interested in solving problems than in uh, partisan politics, so that I think either one of them, if they were elected, would really work to get things done, working with members of the other party. Um, but I just saw the, the, this evening, uh, not only is Obama up now in the national polls, since the last debate by anywhere from five, six to nine, depending on the poll. But um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida uh, have now, are now all in the Obama camp, at least for now, in the electoral vote, uh, by anywhere from six to eight points. So um, if, I had to, if I were a betting man, I would bet on Obama. But 34 days left, anything could happen. You think it's pretty much down to the point where he's just got to close the sale? And that's why it's his to lose, assuming that he does okay in the final two debates and nothing big happens? Uh, assuming that tomorrow night's debate uh, is um, it's certainly going to be interesting and colorful. <laughs> um, I think Sarah Palin's going to do better than we uh, anticipate. And uh, I've got my fingers crossed that Joe Biden behaves himself. <laughs> um, and that nobody, if the, if the next two debates are like the last two debates, or the first debate, I'm sorry, where there's no real major mistake by either one, uh, then I think Obama's just got to hold on, be tough, and stay on the economic message and keep coming back that these, the, his central message, these are the guys that broke it, you can't trust them to fix it. And... Um, and with that, I think he can ride the economy all the way to November 4th. I think you're absolutely right. I got one final question before we open it up to all of you. Is there any possibility, or is this just a really naive question? Is that I run for president? Yes, no. <laughs> is there any possibility that sometime in our lifetime, 
that campaigns are going to go back to kind of the presentation of the classic presentation of two different views of governance that are very clear choices that give voters a clear direction as to which way they want to go. I mean, I think the last one, I would argue the last one was in 1984, but you may or may not agree with that. Well, first of all, I do think there's a clear choice today. I don't think there's been uh, a clearer choice between the two candidates than we have between John McCain and, and Barack Obama on the war, on the economy, on health care, um, on almost every issue. Um, they would take the country in a different direction. And they're certainly two different breed of cats, if you look at them. You know, I mean, just uh, they're two generationally, they're two different, uh, two, two very different uh, candidates. Um, but I, I know what you're saying. We got back to a campaign where you get rid of all, you get rid of Britney Spears and Paris Hilton, and you're not talking about lipstick, and you don't, you don't have the mud slinging, and you just have an honest discussion of the issues. Again, I come back to, I think, because of cable news and its impact, uh, I don't think we'll ever see that day again, uh, regretfully and sadly so. Very regretfully, very much so. Well, we're ready to go to Q&A now. We've got uh, Peter and Julia both have oh, uh, we are. microphones. If you do like Dr. Ballard ask, and please wait for somebody to recognize you, and then ask your question, just one question. We'll pass it to Professor Drury right here. Wait for the microphone, please, Professor. I regard... Donald, I regard our president as a spokesperson for the vice president. Oh. Would you concur in that judgment? I think he's a front man. Uh, I, I have to say, I disagree with that a little uh, uh, to this. I think in the beginning it was pretty clear that uh, George Bush was the puppet and Dick Cheney was the puppeteer. Um, but I think as the administration has progressed that George Bush got more comfortable in the role and started making more decisions. And I think today, for all practical purposes, Dick Cheney's a backbencher. I mean, he, I, you know, they put him in the bunker and they haven't let him out of the bunker in a long time. I mean, uh, I, he, he certainly has not been, you know, okay, he went up to, he went up to Congress last, last week for, for, for one day, but he's, he's not out as much in the news, he's not doing the interviews, he's not articulating the policy for the administration the way he was. But I think in the beginning, it clearly was um, the old man showing the, the young Turk, uh, you know, how to, how to govern. And some of the most important decisions were made, like going to war, and like the tax cuts, and some of the others were made in those in those uh, and the uh, wiretapping program were made in those early days, but I, I don't want to let George Bush off the hook by saying it's all not personally. It's all uh, Dick Cheney. Okay, other questions, right here, Tom. Wait for Julia. Yeah. To hey, and by on. the way, um, you know, having uh, sparred with Bob Novak and Mary Madeline and Tucker Carlson and uh, and Pat Buchanan my entire life. I, I, I love people that disagree with me, so, uh, and I'm thick-skinned, so don't, don't hesitate to uh, disagree. My turn. All right. <laughs> well, you paint the broad brush on the media. Would you make any distinctions, for example, PBS, NPR, and the print media, as opposed to cable news? Yeah, I was not, I, I actually have a, uh, I know I know a lot of conservatives think that NPR is uh, is part of the liberal media, if you want to use that, or PBS. Um, I don't. I I find them uh, so maddeningly uh, middle of the road uh, that that I it's, I find it hard to listen or watch, to tell the truth. Um, again. Because I have a point of view and I'm used to expressing it, it drives me crazy that they're so they're, they're so careful and they're so so balanced. Um, so when I my comments about the media were particularly directed to Fox, CNN, and uh, and um, MSNBC, and, and MSNBC. 
and uh, my complaint with the with the major networks, I watch, I try to watch as much as I can. That's my job, right? I mean, I read as much as I can, watch as much as I can. So I watch Charlie Gibson every night. I watch Brian Williams every night, and some nights I watch Katie Couric instead of Charlie Gibson's night. So um, I'm watching all three. But uh, I, I I mentioned this a little earlier at dinner. To me, the fact that the networks, the most that they can give you is a half an hour a day, and that's all that they're willing to give to telling us the news of the day. And then with that half an hour, maybe you get eight minutes of news, and the rest are medical stories, you know, and the rest are uh, ads for erectile dysfunction medication. <laughs> you know, it's pretty, pretty pathetic. Um, uh, and I read, look, I read uh, the Post and the New York Times and the, and the Washington Times and the Washington Examiner and the Wall Street Journal. And uh, as Barbara mentioned, I feel like a dinosaur reading any newspaper, let alone, you know, five a day. Um, I, I still think for the most part that the, uh, that the newspapers de deliver the news um, they're, they're, and leave the editorial opinion to the editorial page and the op-ed page. But occasionally it bleeds through to, in the on the front page, where it doesn't belong. I mean, editorial opinion. So, but overall, I just have to say I think that uh, they get a failing grade. Other questions, right here, and then uh, Peter, if you would go back behind Julia because we got a couple people in that back. back and also back on that there. side too, your side. Oh, do we have yeah. somebody over yeah. there? Yeah. Who do we have over there? Raise your hand. We'll get you next. You'll be number two. Let's get this one right here first. Uh, Hi there. You you mentioned that uh, George Bush assumed extraordinary powers, and uh, some have described some of these powers as being basically fascist practice. Uh, but regardless of how you label them, I'm wondering. Um, where, where did these come from, or, or what accounts for this? Is it just simply that Bush assumed the war powers, or, I mean, if Cheney was uh, leading him very much in the beginning, uh, what prompted Cheney to go in this direction? Well, where? okay, uh, as I mentioned, um, and I could, I could read from here where Cheney actually gave testimony uh, in Congress where he said, if you want to know what I think about the powers of the, I guess it was an interview, the powers of the presidency go back to a minority report that I filed when I was a member of Congress on a particular committee where he lays out that he thinks that, um, that, the, that President Nixon relinquished too many powers of the presidency. So that's, that's kind of where he, started, where he started from. I wouldn't call it fascist, as liberal as I am, I think, but I would say that the concept that the powers that he assumed are unconstitutional and illegal. Uh, in many ways, it's an outlaw administration, in, in my judgment. For example, the wiretapping. I mean, you know, you've heard this before. I hate to keep beating what may be like a dead horse by now, but there is a law that says if you are going to uh, tap the phone of an American citizen, you've got to go to the FISA court and get a warrant. And the FISA court had, in its history, had denied maybe one. I mean, they were basically a rubber stamp court. And if you couldn't, if you, if you felt you needed to start it right away, you didn't have to go to the court. You could start it right away, and within 72 hours, you had to go to the court. As clear, the law was there. It was in 1976. And President Bush said it was an old law. Well, you know, you and I don't decide. Well, we, we obey the new laws, but not the old laws, you know, or... We obey them back to 1980, but not 1976. I mean, that, to me, that was a blatant, clear violation of the laws. And what's really disturbs me is Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives. In the end, what did Congress do? They okayed that practice. Rather than say, wait a minute, you've got to obey the law like anybody else. So, um, they, and how, where and how they assumed them, yes, you are right. Uh, we are in now a perpetual, eternal state of war called the War on Terror. So they use, not the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan, but the War on Terror as justification for extraordinary measures that are above the law. It was against, you didn't have to, Congress didn't have to pass any new legislation. It was against American law 
to torture prisoners of war. It was also against international law to torture prisoners of war. We did it. Congress let the president get away with it. We did, I say, you know, the administration did. Peter, you have a question back there? So Congress wasn't doing its job. Yes, um, I have a question Hi. about, I know you were a Hillary Clinton supporter in the primaries, or <laughs> I think you were. Um, what do you think about the lack of, it seems, 100% support? Why do you think I was? Um, when I listened to your radio show, it seemed like you were leaning in that direction. Is that true? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think of it? It seems like Bill Clinton isn't 100% on the Obama bandwagon in, in the speeches I've seen him give. He Even in some of the um, new shows that he's on, he compliments McCain nearly as much as he compliments Obama. And I just want to know if you think that's true or if it's just his way of approaching it. It drives me crazy. Uh, in fact, if you had listened this morning, I spent a, a, a whole hour beating up on Bill Clinton uh, and, and, and demanding that he get with the program, you know. Uh, he gave a great speech. Look, obviously, he was all out for Hillary in the primary, and I defended everything he said in the primary, just saying, oh, you know, this is a primary campaign. She thinks she's the best candidate. He thinks she's the best candidate. They got their right to... And anybody who said the primary, that, that, that they ought to end the primaries right now and just give it to Obama, I kept saying, wait a minute, he doesn't have enough delegates yet. He didn't get to the magic number yet, so you can't, you can't ask that this thing end that soon. It's got to go all the way to the finish line. Um, so, but then, at the convention, she gave a great speech for Obama. He gave a great speech for Obama. So I figured, okay, he's on the bus, right? And then, last week, Clinton said um, that McCain acted in good faith when he suspended his campaign. Uh, he said, he praised his leadership on global warming. He gave him a big speaking spot at his global initiative, which was covered on all the networks. Uh, he said he would never say anything bad about John McCain. Uh, he called him a great man. Uh, he said he couldn't go uh, campaign for Obama because of the Jewish holidays. <laughs> First time I heard that excuse in politics. So don't go to Florida, you know, go somewhere else. And, uh, and then finally, if you saw Meet the Press last Sunday, Tom Brokaw says, now are you ready to say as nice things about Barack Obama as you said about John McCain? And Bill Clinton said, well, he said, I only met him once. That was his answer. I, only, I just shook his hand once. And, um, and Hillary told me to go out and campaign for him, so... I guess I will, or something. I mean, it was so tepid. Yeah, so anyhow, I really pounded Clinton this morning. But, again, I just checked online. Bill Clinton was in Florida today, and apparently, maybe he was listening to my show this morning. I don't know. I'd like to think so. Apparently, this, apparently I haven't heard the clips yet. He gave a barn burner of a speech in, uh, in Florida today uh, in support of Barack Obama. Uh, enthusiastically and taken a few pot shots at both McCain and Sarah Palin. So, and I think Jonathan has some uh, big news for us. Just, just real quick, I know some of you are news junkies in the audience. The Senate very easily passed a $700 billion bailout bill to stabilize Wall Street. I think I was counting with a pen and the number was 7425. Right. So much for our, the Senate. God bless. You heard it here first. Thanks, Thanks John. Yeah. I think we had at least a couple more questions. Julia, back in the back back there. Yeah, I see two hands. Let's get those next. Um, you mentioned Barry Goldwater on the issue of gays in the military. Yeah. Do you consider modern conservative social issues as a betrayal of the traditional conservative legacy? Yes. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because the way I understand uh, conservative philosophy, and I, it's hard for me to speak as a liberal of it, but from, from my research that I've done and the conservatives that I know, it's uh, keep government out of our lives. And the less government in our lives, the better. And especially, especially, keep government out of our bedroom. So I find it mysterious how um, conservatives got so, um, you know, intensely interested in gay sex, right? Um, what's that all about? You know, I mean, I, 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 I think the traditional conservative would say, um, you know, we are all 
free to live our private life uh, as we choose to do so. I, I, I think that's the basic conservative position, and it's just keep government uh, out of my bedroom. You know, we used to talk about the, the Reagan coalition was built on three stools. One was economic conservatism, one was uh, strong foreign policy, and one was social conservatism. And you hit the nail on the head. And the way you said it was funny in the book because you used it, I believe you used this as an example of how conservatives can't get anything done. But you said, I think your line was, Reagan greatly undermined the conservative movement by helping to eliminate the ever-present threat of godless communism. In effect, he basically undercut his, his own coalition by being so successful on that. And I'll tell you where that comes from. That comes from a conversation I had with Pat Buchanan about the book and the idea, my idea for the book and shaping it. And, and, and Pat pointed out that, um, it, you know, so as I mentioned, Taft and others were conservatives who were against our entry into World War II. We'll get into World War II, and then comes the Cold War. And then there's this godless communism. And that became the defining issue of conservatives and, 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 the, and that, that conflict between East and West and um, the evil empire that everybody, that conservatives coalesced around. When the Berlin Wall went down, suddenly they were left without a raison d'etre, without a defining force. And conservatives then, uh, many of them went then, well, what do we, where do we go? Some went into the, and then it becomes uh, abortion and gay marriage, right? Uh, and others looked for, when, uh, what is John Quincy Adams' phrase? It went up searching abroad for monsters to destroy or something, you know, looked for another coalescing force and when 9-11 happened, presto, bingo, there it is, Islamic fascism or Islamic terrorism, sorry, and, um, uh, and, 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 and the war on terror. And to a certain extent, not as much, that has become a new defining force. Uh, you may, folks may not have been here, may not remember, but two years ago this fall we had a speaker who is a traditional conservative who actually gave a talk on the coming split between conservatism and the religious right. And, and that was part of his premise that there's inconsistencies, big inconsistencies there. We have another question back here, do we? Didn't somebody have their hand up? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Earlier in the study group, we talked about the importance of staying on message for a candidate. You mentioned that Barack Obama should tie his answers back to the economy. My question is that it seems that the media has an inability to push politicians off their talking points, and do you feel that that inability short circuits deliberative democracy of getting true answers to our questions? That the media has an inability to do so? Yeah. Um, It's tough sometimes. Uh, the, the one thing, uh, let me just give a personal side to it. I, I, I debated, I was on the debate team in high school, I was on the debate team in college, I coached debate in high school. I love debate. For me, Crossfire was the ideal job, right? And I just loved to get in there and, and mix it up. And I didn't care who won, it wasn't who won or who lost, it was let's just have a good knock down, drag out, fight over the issues, you know, and really get into it. And um, so the, the people that I came to have no respect for were not the ones who cleaned my clock or not the ones who were really, really strong uh, expressing a different point of view to mine, but the ones who were so obviously just reciting talking points. And you can, you can tell the day and you can hear them. And, and I could hear them. And I would just sort of zone out if they just started, you know, oh, God, here they go, you know. Uh, and you know, listen, listen carefully today to people on, on, the, on radio or television, and you can tell them when they, again, Democrat or Republican, some of them, they can't think for themselves, so they're just repeating what the Republican National Committee or the Democratic National Committee put out there today, you know. And some talk show hosts are like that, by the way. You know, they're so predictable. They will never never criticize somebody, a member of their own party, uh, or um, you know, someone that they've agreed with in the past. So, uh, that's just a, a long way around of getting to your question of saying, uh, I don't care if it's tough, the media still got to, they still got to do their job of penetrating 
and basically if they if they come back with the talking points then just go back again and I, I tell you who's done the best job of that lately I think is Katie Cork um, who was lampooned in the beginning but her show her I think her newscast is getting better and better and in her interviews with Sarah Palin she wasn't uh, offensive she wasn't obnoxious she wasn't uh, rude she just uh, when Palin would sort of give her some brush off or non sequitur answer Katie would come back and say, "No, I hate to, I hate to push this point, but would you please? Blah, 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 would you please?" So, uh, the candidates who always try to do it, it's the media's job not to let them get away with it. Any other questions tonight? Up, oh, we have a question right there, and then we have a question up here. Sir, in your opinion, would term limits do anything to improve our fiscal policies and standing? You know what? I disagree. Uh, I, well, I should say, a lot of my fellow liberals disagree with me on this issue, but I've always supported term limits. Um, I don't care how good you are, I think um, you can be replaced, and um, I just think it's healthy, the turnover is healthy. Look at today, Michael Bloomberg announced he's going to run for a third term as mayor of New York. I think he's done a pretty good job as mayor of New York, he certainly did a better job than Giuliani. Uh, in terms, he doesn't have as many enemies as Giuliani. I mean, he's, he, he's better. He's better liked, I think. Going, and but you can't tell me in the largest city on the planet that there's not somebody else capable of being mayor of New York. It's sort of like Bloomberg is saying, "I'm the only guy who can do this job," you know. And so you have to change the rules so I can have a third term. Um, I was a big Bill Clinton fan, but um, after two terms, I think it was time for him to move on. <laughs> I wish, you know, I wish George Bush hadn't succeeded him. But uh, so uh, I, I don't know. I, I just think, that, look, we lose some good people in the process, no doubt about it. But in the end, I think we come out ahead by having the turnover. So I think it would improve every area of our public policy. If we have one last question here. Oh, actually, okay, yes, okay. we have two. We'll do these two, and that'll be it for tonight. And then I'll see you all at the radio studio at four o'clock in the morning. Five a.m. <laughs> I'll be there at four. You can, you can, you can, you can sleep a little later. You can come in at five. Thank you very much. It's it's wonderful to, to have this dialogue. Um, I think it's pretty easy for us to beat up on the conservatives, to even beat up on the Democrats, to beat up on all the, the liberal um, right or whatever, liberal left. I mean, all the nuances of, of conservatism and liberalism. I'm a teacher. And so in my heart of hearts, I have to also be self-critical. And I have to talk about this notion of the dumbing down of America. That is, and it, it happens all the time. That is what we don't allow, for instance, in an educational environment where we miss great opportunities to inform the students who are going to become civic minded participants. We don't do enough of that. In fact, we push the stick the other way. Uh, and that has, over time, it seems to me, also allowed for this apathetic, apathetic uh, tendency and sensibility, which is allowed the actions to take place. So I think while on one hand we should talk about what's wrong at the top, we have to also say what we as American people have failed to do in terms of our own responsibility. So can you address somewhat uh, the issue of where the public stands? What are our failings in terms of lack of responsibility and lack of action? Well, <laughs> That's a great comment, and, uh, and I could almost let it stand as a comment and just say amen. Um, but just, just to ask a couple of, first of all, educate, I'm a former teacher too, and my best two years, I think, were the two years I spent in the high school classroom uh, in San Francisco. And I mean, I don't think there's anything more important than, than first of all, providing all of our kids with, a, with the best education that we can at every level, but also encouraging them and 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 almost forcing them to think to think for themselves and not just take what they hear and on any issue and really challenge challenge you as a teacher and challenge what their fellow classmates have said that's so important you know to instill that in people and then once for, for us who are part of now the of the active citizenship and voting process I mean a lot of the responsibility does go back to us in terms of how willing we are to get involved 
in civic issues, uh, how willing we are to spend the time to volunteer in a political campaign, uh, to serve on a committee, to, to you know, get involved in our churches or the PTAs. Uh, I think we've lost a lot of that uh, spirit of volunteerism and uh, active citizenship, um, which, which gets right down to the basic thing of the, the, the alarming number of Americans who don't even bother to vote and don't even bother to register to vote. So, um, you know, and I, I think that's where political leadership can come in, too. And I, I, one of the things that I did support Hillary in the primary, um, voted for her, but one of the things that I found so impressive about Barack Obama is he, more than any politician I think we've seen since maybe Bobby Kennedy, has the ability to really inspire people of all generations to take politics seriously again and, and to get involved themselves. Uh, we've seen incredible numbers of people turning out uh, to vote, to register. The, the stories that I've heard around the country, state after state after state, they've never had volunteer activity at this level as they do this year. So, um, you know, we, we have an important role to play and, and hopefully we'll take our uh, responsibilities and uh, obligations and opportunities as citizens more seriously. Okay, well, Until we do, you know, we're, always, we're never going to be well served. Sorry about that, Bill. We have one yes. final question right here. When you spoke about the uh, uh, performance of the media during this campaign, um, I'm sure we all recognize the bias of Fox on one side and the bias of MSNBC on the other side, although MSNBC is a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, <laughs> but what, what would you have CNN do that they haven't done? I, I don't see the bias there. Uh, uh, well, I, I, for the most part, I don't. I have to agree with that. I don't see, certainly, I, I, here's what I, my, my advice in having worked at CNN for six years, uh, my advice to, if I were asked, to the management of CNN would be the way things are shaping up, you've got Fox, which is clearly and proudly on the right, MSNBC, which may not admit it so much, but was, which is clearly and to the left. And I think that's fine. You've got one on one side and you have one on the other. And I think CNN's job is to try to be the, the um, network of record, if you will, that um, covers politics, covers the news, but just delivers it. And they, if they have commentators on, which they will, that they always have clearly marked and they always have a balance of views. So I think that if, if they can stick to that, um, that's probably not too bad. Yeah. And I think that's what CNN has decided, although sometimes it's hard to figure out. Bill, thank you very much. You're a class hey, thank act. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you.